Hello and welcome to Global Health TV. In today's show, we'll be looking at the environmental impact of wildfires and the effect of extreme heat events on health. The size and frequency of wildfires are growing due to climate change. Hotter and drier conditions are drying out ecosystems and increasing the risk of wildfires. Wildfires impact the climate by releasing large quantities of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and fine particular matter into the atmosphere. Resulting air pollution can cause a range of health issues, including respiratory and cardiovascular problems. Dr. Marilyn Black from the Chemical Insights Research Institute and Dr. Jim Zong from Duke University have been researching the health impact of wildfires. Our very own Max Winnitz caught up with them at the Society of Toxicology meeting in Nashville, Tennessee. We are being joined in studio by Dr. Marilyn Black of Underwriter Laboratories and Dr. Jim Zhang, a professor at Duke University. Guys, thank you so much for joining us here today. Appreciate it. Um, we are here to talk about wildfires. It's something very topical. Unfortunately, we hear about notorious fires happening all the time across the country, especially out west. We really want to talk about the, the health impact, and specifically, I guess, with, with the smoke coming from those fires. Why are wildfires, Dr. Black, a, uh, a public health threat? Wildfires are um, increasing in number and they are burning faster and hotter than they ever have before, primarily because of all the fuel that is being contributed to them. And one of, one of the areas where the, we have the fastest growth is in what we call the WUI interface, where the wildland fire is meeting the community and burning our community, our structures, and things like that. And by doing that, it's adding a lot of materials to the combustion mix. A typical home, I think, will release around 28 tons of fuel and that's from synthetic chemicals, plastics, things that are used to build and construct uh, these, these particular uh, homes and, and, and buildings. And the real concern is all of these things are combining with the wildland emissions, which are organic chemicals and particles, and creating more of this toxic soup of um, uh, chemicals and particles that we, we haven't even characterized very well. Um, but we know that we are seeing s significant health effects related to respiratory concern in uh, things like asthma, cardiovascular impact uh, from, from the exposure to the smoke. Uh, Dr. Zhang, the current understanding of the unique chemistry of wildfire emissions and their subsequent impacts on human health, quite limited. And what do we know so far? As, as you said, it's the emerging issue. Uh, the wildfire has been there, but just the, the new characteristics uh, that just caught the uh, attention uh, to the public uh, recently. Also, this is related to climate change as a factor to facilitate the frequency of the wildfires and also the intensity of wildfire. So we started to realize this is an really important issue. Uh, we started to understand the smoke composition, you know, biomass, the wood, the, 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 the brushes, that sort of thing, but all the synthetic chemicals, so that sort of thing. That is really something the traditional air pollution field has not uh, really you know, the intensive study. Uh, I think it's fair to see that took us 40, 50 years to work on other air pollution services like industrial emissions, traffic emissions, and uh, photochemical reaction, that sort of thing. So uh, that's why, you know, we just started where there's this, the new source of air pollution. And uh, we, we have lots of work to uh, need to be done. Sure, and Dr. Black, um, what about long-term environmental uh, damage from wildfires? How does that impact human health? Again, we're learning on that, but we know that from the wildfires that we do get a lot of residue and effluent that can occur from them, which can migrate into our soil, into our water system, um, that can negatively impact the ecosystem in general and, and, and regrowth, uh, also contaminate um, the soil that, that we're going to be building and living on and um, enter the waterways, which can affect um, um, the, the organisms that are living in the waterways are changing things in a way that we don't totally understand yet. Yeah. Dr. Zhang, you care to uh, 
follow up with that? Sure. Uh, you know, I think the community exposure, that's something uh, to an idiot that much less on the student. Uh, the, re- the contribution of wildfire events to the regional air pollution, that's, that's, we know the impact is big because we have lots of uh, uh, toxicological evidence uh, and also epidemiological evidence to show that particular matter from any sources uh, is associated with a, a range of health effects, right? And yet we know that wildfire will contribute, not just that local, that, that fire spot, but region, it will increase the significant uh, levels of particular matter once the wildfire occurs, right? It can go several hundred miles. And uh, how we can attribute the contribution from this particular source to the also health effects of that. I think we started to do it. We have the tools, and, and we can do it fair, uh, uh, and, you know, a, a good uh, uh, kind of work to quantify that contribution. I would want to add a sure. study work ongoing, and this is a collaboration on the writer's laboratory at um, Duke University, a university that's on in California. We have a, a, a team of epidemiologists, exposure scientists, st- a statistician, air pollution specialists working together to do a uh, clinical trial, if you will. It's an intimation trial. We are Doing this trial in Los Angeles, uh, that's the area it was a prob to wildfire impact. So we have a, uh, we recruited people with the pre diabetic uh, conditions. The uh, older folks, they have, they they have a higher risk to uh, metabolic disorders. And we are uh, giving, um, with the running of the trial with the help of air purifiers. It's a little cost one and maybe because our goal is to see if this kind of device that affordable, commercially available, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get clinical evidence to show people using this for uh, six to nine months, uh, we expect their metabolic-related well, symptoms and uh, something we call biomarks, the thing that would measure subclinical but a risky indicator, like blood pressure, like sugar level, that sort of thing, is going to improve once we use this uh, type of filtration in a home. So it's a very practical, but I think we don't have a solid clinical evidence to, to support this. Dr. Black, anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's a you know great study that we're doing. We'll learn a lot about it. It'll take us a few years to, to work through it. But the only other thing that I wanted to add, and I like to focus on this because I think we have about 99 million people now in the United States living in what we call the wooey zone. They're in a fire uh, opportunity zone. And we're seeing that over 50% of all new homes are being built in those environments. And so the concept of understanding that and potentially to start addressing the land management development policies that need to match up with the risks that, that, that these folks are incurring. Well, thank you both for your time. Really appreciate it. In addition to wildfires, climate change is also increasing the number and intensity of extreme heat events. At the Society of Toxicology meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, my colleague Max Winnitz spoke to global health professor Christy Eby from University of Washington about how this affects health and increases mortality. We are being joined in studio right now by Dr. Chris Eby, a professor at the University of Washington. Thanks for joining us here today. Thank you for your interest. Uh, We are dealing with a a very topical subject, extreme heat, something we are experiencing not just here in the U.S., but but across the globe. Has your research proven that that heat events, extreme heat events, are increasing uh, across the world? Not my individual research, but there is a robust body of literature that does show that heat waves have already increased in frequency, intensity, and duration. And we're having heat waves, such as the Pacific Heat Dome a year and a half ago, that was virtually impossible without climate change. So not only are we seeing more and more intense heat waves, we're seeing very extreme heat waves. Is there an area of the world that is experiencing this perhaps more than than others over the past few years? 
We have evidence for mostly high income areas. It does not mean that the low income areas are not being affected. We do know, for example, there's been major heat waves in India and Pakistan. There's little data for Africa, so we don't have that evidence from Africa. But where we have evidence, everybody's being affected. We often hear about heat stroke, heat exhaustion, but what other ways can extreme heat impact uh, the, the health uh, of, of our citizens here in the U.S. And, and across the world? There's so many different groups that are vulnerable to heat. One that is in, getting increasing attention are pregnant women. Women exposed to high temperatures at the end of their pregnancy are having more low birth weight babies, which has consequences for the baby throughout their life course. Outdoor workers. I live in Seattle. We're one of four states that has regulations to protect outdoor workers during these very high temperatures. Reductions in worker productivity. And the biggest area of concern where we've got the most research is excess mortality where people die in heat waves that would not have died otherwise. So what can be done to prevent excess mortality? We need to raise awareness and we need for people to understand what services are available for them. Within cities, regions, there is a lot of effort to develop heat wave early warning and response systems, which moves beyond the forecast, it's gonna be hot, to saying, here's all the things you need to do. There's lots of actions people can take that don't involve air conditioning. They can put some water on their skin and sit in front of an electric fan. That evaporation of the water off the skin will really cool them down. There's lots of other kinds of options that people can take, but they have to know. And they have to be motivated to take action. It's particularly difficult because one of the groups most at risk are adults over the age of 65. A natural part of the aging process is people become less well able to tell that they're getting into trouble with the heat. So they often don't take those actions, even though they know they should because they don't feel like they're at risk. So we have to find better ways to communicate and to motivate so that people do take the actions they need to protect themselves, their family, their loved one. And are, are there cities across the U.S. that are adopting some of these initiatives already? There's many cities in the U.S. that already have heat wave early warning and response systems. The first was in Philadelphia, and there are systems in Chicago, in Detroit, all over the East Coast. Miami has a particularly effective one, as does Phoenix. I'm not saying the others are not effective. I single out Phoenix and Miami because they've named heat officers. So each city has a person whose job it is to make sure that they coordinate across all the city services. They reach out to the trusted voices for redlined communities, other marginalized populations, to make sure that people are aware of the challenges and know what the services are that they can access. Phoenix and some of the research they've done in their area, about half of all the excess deaths in a heat wave are in the homeless. So they have quite a effective program to reach out to the homeless to help to pr protect them during high temperatures. Heat is an all of society issue. And when you start thinking about all the different groups that could be affected, you do need to reach out quite broadly and make sure that you have ways to communicate effectively with each individual group. Well, let's hope more cities get on board, more meteorologists in, in cities uh, get on board and, and, and pass along this important message. And uh, not, just, not just in the US, but across the globe, because as you said, this is a global issue. Uh, Dr. Chris Ebai, thank you so much for your time. So that's all for this episode of Global Health TV. Next time, we'll be hearing about the toxic aging coin with Dr. Johnny Wise, contaminants in cannabis with Dr. Maxwell Lung, and learning about the latest research into the role of the environment in autism spectrum disorder from Johns Hopkins' Dr. Lena Sminova. Until then, it's goodbye.